And when people are given the proper type of information and they can repeat that information and they can understand it intellectually and then they're given some type of practice to apply it if they do it properly they should have some type of transformation that transformation should be in their body in their mind or somewhere in their life and so i've had the opportunity and privilege to witness transformation all over the world and i can tell you that on every culture transformation looks exactly the same when people are literally liberated from the chains of their own self-imposed limitations the side effect is true freedom and true joy and so it's been my honor and my privilege to really witness and participate in watching people really apply these principles to make measurable changes in their life i want to take a little bit of time and talk to you about how i got involved in all of this but before i do that i just wanted to take a minute and acknowledge all those people that are actually doing it from the last video. I love your comments. I love the fact that you're making the effort to cross that river of change that we talked about. In 1986, I was run over by a truck in a triathlon. I was coming up to a corner and there was a police officer on the corner and I was passing two bicyclists and he was pointing at me and he was waving me on to make this turn. And as I merged past these two cyclists, the problem was, was that the police officer had his back to the oncoming traffic. So as I made the turn, a four-wheel drive Bronco uh, catapulted me out of my bicycle and I landed squarely on my back. As a result of that, I wound up breaking six vertebrae in my spine. When you land hard on your back or on your butt, the compressive force takes the columns of these vertebrae, these blocks, and compresses them like pancakes. And so I had broken six vertebrae in that fashion called compression fractures. Now, when you compress matter like that or mass and you flatten it out, the volume of that matter has to go somewhere. And in my case, it went back onto my spinal cord. So I had multiple compression fractures of my spine and six vertebrae, and I had bone fragments on my cord. One of the vertebrae was more than 60% collapsed, and when it collapsed, the neural arch, the arch that contains the spinal cord, broke like a pretzel, so I had cord compression. Now, the typical surgery for something like this is a radical surgery called the Harrington Rod Surgery, where they cut out the back parts of the vertebrae, and in my case, it would be the base of my neck to the base of my spine. And then they screw in these long stainless steel rods, and when they screw the screws into these rods, the force of the screws cantilevers the spinal column off the spinal cord, and they were hoping that it would reduce the amount of pressure on my spinal cord. At that time, I was facing a lot of neurological problems, and I was in severe pain, and I had a lot of numbness. So I had four opinions from four of the leading surgeons in Southern California, and after four opinions, I decided to not have the surgery. And so I had this idea in my mind at the time kept saying to me over and over again, the power that made the body heals the body. I didn't know what that meant to the degree that I know now, but I understood that there's an intelligence that's giving us life in each and every one of us. It's the same intelligence that's keeping your heart beating right now and digesting your food and organizing hundreds of thousands of chemical reactions in one cell of your body in one second, that you're losing 10 million cells every second and you're making another 10 million that there's an intelligence that has a mind that's much greater than our mind. It has a will, actually, that's so much greater than our will. And it has a love for life that's so much greater than our love for life. And so I thought if my will could match its will, if my mind could match its mind, and if my love for life could match its love for life, maybe it would answer the call. So I wasn't going anywhere or doing anything. I was basically laying face down. I made two decisions. The first decision was I was going to make contact with this intelligence. And when I made contact with it, I was going to give it a very specific plan, a very specific design, a very specific template. And I was going to make sure that template was complete. And when it was complete and to my satisfaction, then I would surrender my creation to a greater mind and allow it to do what it did best. In other words, if I was, if it was up to me, to take care of all these bodily functions, I probably wouldn't survive. So it wasn't my job. My job was to surrender to a greater mind that could do it better than me. 
The second thing I thought about was that I wasn't going to let any thought slip by my awareness that I didn't want to experience. Well, both of those things sound really easy, but the problem was I realized very quickly that I couldn't get my mind to do what I wanted it to do. And secondly, I didn't have the focus to maintain a very complete model. I would start off thinking about reconstructing my vertebrae, vertebrae per vertebrae and redesigning my spine and then the next thing you know I'd be thinking about spending the rest of my life in a wheelchair or I would just be thinking about should I sell my home and I'd have to start all over again and I realized that we're in crisis when we're in crisis or when we're in trauma or diagnosis or disease when we have some type of catastrophe we tend to focus on what we don't want to have happen instead of what we do want to have happen and that's because of the hormones of stress and so when we're living in stress, we're living in survival, and we're always preparing ourselves for the worst thing that could happen in our life. Because anything less, we have better chances of survival. So instead of selecting the optimal outcome for myself, I was selecting the thing that I probably would be working against me. So for six weeks, I went through absolute hell because I couldn't do what I wanted to do. After about six weeks of my own personal torment, things started to get easier, and I noticed in a very short amount of time that I was able to do what took me three hours to reconstruct my spine. I was able to do it in my mind in about 45 minutes. And I knew after a period of time that something was happening in my brain and body, that I was firing and wiring new circuits in my mind, and at the same time I was sharpening my ability to pay attention. And it turns out that attention is a skill, just like golf or tennis. The more you practice being present and paying attention, the better you get at it. So at six weeks, things changed. I started to notice that it got easier for me. I noticed the pain in my body diminished drastically. I also noticed that the numbness and the neurological changes were, were diminishing very rapidly. And I started to see what I was doing inside of me was producing some effect outside of me. So then I started paying attention to what I did, and I did it with more passion, more excitement. And so I was back on my feet in 10 weeks and walked back into my life, but I made a deal with myself. That deal that I made with myself in those lonely nights was that if I was ever able to walk again, I'd spend the rest of my life studying the mind-body connection or mind over matter. And so since that point, I've been pretty interested in demystifying some of these concepts, really looking to see if every human being has the ability to heal themselves. So that kind of got me started on my first book and I started studying spontaneous remissions where I was looking at people that were diagnosed with health conditions. They were treating conventionally or unconventionally, they were staying the same or getting worse and all of a sudden they got better. And I wanted to know what the cause was that produced that effect. So. I wrote my first book, Evolve Your Brain, and uh, as a result of the first book, many people started asking the same question, well, good information, but how do you do it? We were merging the concepts of quantum physics and neuroscience and neuroendocrinology and epigenetics. We wanted to show that, for the most part, that people can create the life they want, and we were inspiring them to actually do it. But people wanted to know how to do it. And so the second thing they wanted to know is if your personality creates your personal reality and I have to change my personality to create a different personal reality, why is it so hard to change my personality? So we started teaching workshops and conferences around the world and I wrote my second book called Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself, which is a how-to book. From that point, I think is when the miracles started happening. We started seeing people healing themselves of MS and lupus and cancer and diabetes and uh, rare genetic disorders, and, uh, traumatic brain injuries, Parkinson's disease, uterine fibroids, thyroid conditions, other endocrine conditions. Uh, we were seeing pretty significant changes in people's health and then we started to see some very significant changes in their life. They were creating relationships or the jobs or the opportunities that they wanted by just changing their personality. This started the journey for me because I was interested in beginning to measure some of those changes. And so we brought in a team of scientists and researchers and we teach these advanced workshops around the world. And our interest is to measure transformation. And my theory is 
is that if we can measure transformation in the brain or in the heart or in the field around people's bodies or genetic changes, and we've done all of those things, then people will begin to understand that it's possible for them to do the same. And just like an infection affects a whole community that creates disease, I believe that health can be as infectious as disease. And I'm happy to say that we've witnessed some amazing things in people changing their health and their life. I wrote my third book called You Are the Placebo, and I actually show some very specific brain changes in people with certain health conditions to prove that it wasn't just in their mind, that it was in fact in their brain. And so before I uh, go on, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the concept of meditation because we use the model of meditation to help people to begin to make those changes. So if you think about this, your senses plug you into your external environment. Everything you're seeing or smelling or tasting or feeling or hearing, all of your five senses are affecting your brain. So if you're waking up in the morning and you're going through the same routine behaviors as you did the day before, and you're not in the process of being defined by a vision of the future, then you're for the most part left with the old hardware in your brain from the past. As a matter of fact, your brain is organized to reflect everything you know from the past. So as people wake up and they begin to pay attention to their body, they start to look around in their environment, they start to do typical things, it's the external environment that's turning on different circuits in their brain, causing them to think equal to their environment. And if you have the idea that your thoughts have something to do with your destiny, as long as you're thinking equal to your environment, you keep creating the same reality over and over again. So to change is to think greater than your environment, to think greater than the circumstances in your world, to think greater than the conditions in your life. I think every great person in history understood this. They were defined by a vision.